to Eye on America. I'm Michelle Miller. From coast to coast, we're bringing you the stories of those who are creating change for the better in their communities, some going beyond what meets the eye. First, we share a personal story of a couple's push to help end a terminal hereditary disease that can be passed on to children. CBS Sports and Turner Sports sideline reporter Allie LaForce and Major League pitcher Joe Smith have made it their mission to help families have babies born free of Huntington's disease. CBS Saturday Morning co-host Dana Jacobson sat down with the couple to talk about their journey. This is the very beginning of our journey to make our first child together. We have three frozen embryos without Huntington's disease. For over three years, Woo! I did it. Turner Sports sideline reporter Allie LaForce has been open and candid about her journey to have a baby. Day five blood work. Using social media to document the highs. Bye little friend. And lows. Today was one of the most emotional and really difficult days. Including a miscarriage. It's not fair if you only post the good and not the bad because that's not real life. I just didn't feel right not sharing because I don't want women to think that something's wrong with them. When there's nothing wrong with them, we're all going through our own personal journey. We all have struggles. The struggle for Allie and her husband, Joe, to have a baby born without Huntington's disease, or HD, a genetic condition that causes the breakdown of nerve cells in the brain. Joe lost his grandmother to HD, and just two years ago, his mom, Lee. Can you explain what that's like when you think about having a family? that this disease might be passed on. Once you live with somebody that's had it or somebody in your family has it and you understand like how devastating this is, like you just watch people deteriorate within a couple of years and do things that, that is not them. It's like a demon takes over your mind. You know, one second you're happy, the next second you're slamming cabinets and yelling at your loved ones, and they, they take it out on the ones they love the most, which is the mm -hmm. hardest. And then on top of that, they lose their ability to walk and speak and eat and swallow. But it is, yeah. It's the worst. There is no cure for Huntington's, and kids of parents with the disease have a 50% chance of getting it. Joe decided not to test for the gene that causes HD. Why did you decide not to get tested? It's tough. There's no treatment, there's no cure. Like, what am I gonna do? Take it easier each day. One thing within their power, having an HD-free baby through an IVF procedure that implants embryos which test negative for that HD gene. Not a single family should be held back from preventing their child from having Huntington's disease or even going through fertility treatments because money stands in the way. It is the heart behind Joe and Allie's foundation help cure HD, a nonprofit that helps pay for families to go through the IVF process, a procedure that can cost up to $40,000. It's not just that your kids don't have Huntington's, their kids will never have Huntington's. Yeah. You're, you're eliminating it from an entire family line yeah. forever, right. which is eradicating a disease one family at a time. In the U.S., there are roughly 41,000 people living with HD and more than 200,000 at risk. In just four years, Allie and Joe's foundation has helped 16 families have HD-free babies. Families like Tracy and Anthony Delonzo's. It was very exciting when we oh found gosh. out that Allie and Joe were doing that for us. After having two kids naturally, Tracy tested positive for HD. Do you think about if symptoms did start soon, what that means for your family. Are you able to even process that? I think about it and it feels like a little bit of a cloud over you all the time because you never know when something's gonna hit. The average age is 30 to 50 for symptoms and I'm 33. She knows what it most likely look like for her um, and it's really, really difficult to see. Just always in the back of our mind and then with any future kids, it was like a huge factor for us yeah. in having children too. You rather would not have yeah. kids than pass on this gene. Right. Then they discovered Help Cure HD. In 2020, they were accepted for a grant to cover the roughly $20,000 cost of having a baby. And in September, Josiah was born HD free. He doesn't know it, 
but he's not going to have that worry in his life. Mm -hmm. He might have it for his family, but not for himself and not for his future family. It's those success stories that fuel Allie and Joe. With all these families that you talked about that you've helped, are these now friendships and bonds in a way with some of them at least? Close with, yeah. We've gotten closer with some of them. Bonds which they say help them stay motivated as they continue their own journey. The man behind the needle. One thing I struggle with is his happiness. I want him to be happy. When I know that we'll have kids without Huntington's disease, I know that if he died tomorrow, he would die in peace knowing that, period. On March 9th, Allie and Joe got one step closer. That's pregnant, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, woohoo! <laughs> You can find out more about Allie and Joe's foundation on HelpCureHD.org. We now transition to climate change in Minnesota, a contributing factor to declining food sources for local bears. But Aaron Hazenzada of CBS Minnesota shows us how the hibernating creatures are adapting amid a changing environment. If you've ever wondered what being a bear biologist looks like, Here's your answer. Navigating waist-deep snow under the canopy of the Chippewa National Forest to find bear 6080. All right, 600 feet. We're getting close, so we have to be quiet. The beeping of a GPS tracker. Strange, we haven't heard anything. She's tiny, though. Then it's time to head first into the den to sedate her. After waiting for that to kick in, we move in. Oh, my God and go head first ourselves into the bear's earthy tunnel. She's been down here since September or October. When this bear is pulled from her den and placed on her makeshift checkup table, researchers find their first surprise. What do you think of her weight? Very, like very small. She weighs 127 pounds. And, uh, she should be around 200. No cubs, even though she's had them before and is 11 in the prime of her reproductive years. We had a really bad food year last year, one of the worst we've had since we started recording in the 80s. Other than that, she's healthy. Our changing environment is changing these bears. Dave Garcellis would know. I started in 1983 and we've been doing this every winter since then. Since the start of this project in 1981, food sources for bears dropped 70 percent, but they learned to adapt. Most of our bears are just as fat as they were prior to this 70% decline. The same reproduction is going on. The same cub survival is going on. Basically, we have bears in a ton of areas we never thought we did. Bouncing back despite ever-growing threats. Coming up, we introduce you to the small-scale oil producer in Oklahoma seeing a boom in business. We'll be right back. Volatility of oil prices in the industry is top of mind right now. Omar Villafranca travels to a small Oklahoma oil field to see how ramping up production is easier said than done. Okay, that's Carol's house. Is that how you identify things? Oh, yeah. Hidden between the barns and buried 3,000 feet underground is Darlene Wallace's fortune. Wallace operates 13 small oil wells near Seminole, Oklahoma, known as stripper wells, producing up to 15 barrels a day for Columbus Oil Company. There are about 400,000 operational stripper wells in the United States. Well, that's why they call them stripper wells, because we are stripping the last bit of oil out of the well that we can possibly get. Anything under $50 a barrel, we lose money. Superintendent Tim Poplin showed us a sample of what they collect. This is the salt water. And this is Wilcox oil. And if you look, it's really not all the way across the top. As long as oil is over $50 a barrel, it's worth doing the work for it. Yes, you. yes. Oil prices have been especially volatile in the last five years, and the boom and bust of the oil patch can have a major impact on small producers like Columbus Oil. All of our wells shut down when it went to a minus number in April. You had to shut down for two months? Yeah. What was that like? It was like not getting a paycheck. Now, that number has reached about $115 a barrel. A pain at the pump for the consumer, but a boom for her small business. Even though it's maybe 
10 to 15 barrels a day. Do you think you guys can help the American economy when it comes to oil and the oil supply? Well, we produce 10% of the American oil. That's what we, you know, that's what stripper wells do. Ed Hurst, an energy fellow at the University of Houston, says even though oil is in a boom, it's not easy to just turn on the pumps. It can take months to get them online, and the workforce, while rebounding, has taken a beating. In the last 10 years, the sector has lost more than 50,000 employees. Our wells are the most expensive oil wells in the world to drill because we don't get the, the huge output that, say, a Saudi well does. It's just a matter of dollars and cents, and no one's going to start drilling unless they can see a path forward to getting uh, revenue and profits. The oil had gone down. Wallace won't slow down and plans to keep pushing production of her small wells. We give people in rural areas jobs. We can't let our, our rural areas dissipate because there are no jobs. She says it may not help Wall Street, but it helps Main Street. Throughout the pandemic, nurses have been frontline heroes by tirelessly fighting COVID-19. But in the past two years, there's been a rise in burnout and staff shortages nationwide. A study found that 34 percent of nurses plan to leave their positions by the end of this year. Natalie Brand visits a Maryland hospital to see how they're addressing the issue head on. My name is Angie. I'm one of the nurses here. How are you today? ICU nurse Angie Wheeler considers the job a calling. But the pandemic posed a test unlike any other in her four decades of experience. The pandemic totally changed nursing. And it's led to a surge in burnout among health care workers nationwide. This hospital in Prince George's County, Maryland, has experienced up to 30 percent turnover in nursing staff, according to Chief Nursing Officer Crystal Beckford. If hospital systems don't address this, what does that mean? Operationally, you could come to a standstill. We have to address nursing burnout. That means rolling out a new self-care strategy, from treats to say thank you, to a quiet room to take a breath, even if only for a few minutes. Notice any tension? Meditation over Zoom. Hold it. Technique shared with new nurses in training. Hospitals uh, engaging with their staff and, and doing the little things really go a long way. Ashley Gick, a nurse of five years, is using a new tuition assistance program to study management as hospitals innovate ways to retain their critical front line. If we keep where we're at right now with staffing shortages, and increased patient ratios. It burns you out, um, heart and soul. While healthcare workers are trained to put others first. What do you think is going to prevent healthcare workers from, from burning out? Taking care of yourself first and foremost. The intensity of the past two years has stressed the importance of taking time to recharge. It's nice in the midst of things to see some beauty. And appreciate life in order to better serve others. Up next, we meet a group of locals throwing a lifeline to an aging icon in the Florida Keys. This is Eye on America. Standing tall in the waters of the Florida Keys is a 150-year-old icon, and it's all thanks to a community effort. The Alligator Reef Lighthouse served as an important navigational aid, and today it has been preserved as a part of local history. Manuel Bajorcas has more. Four miles off the coast of Isla Morada, rising 136 feet above the Aqua Sea, stands Alligator Reef Lighthouse, a fixture on the horizon here for more than a century. It's a beloved symbol of this community. On the village seal, postcards, t-shirts, souvenirs, even hanging over your head at the local diner. Replicas, both small and big. Uh, this is a 14-foot uh, replica of Alligator Lighthouse that I built. Local artist Larry Hurlf is perhaps its biggest fan. His sculptures around town made in honor of the offshore icon. You know, growing up here all my life, I kind of always took it for granted. Until one day, about a decade ago, 
when a boat ride to the lighthouse changed everything. For really the first time in my life, I truly in depthly looked at this thing. Everything was rusted through, and that's the first time I realized, you know, what, you know, condition the lighthouse was in. The thought of losing it was, you know, quite, you know, scary at that point, because what it means to us. Built just after the Civil War, it had shined its light since 1873, guiding countless ships and lives away from danger. But for Larry, its meaning goes deeper. My mother and my brother, their ashes are sprinkled there. You decided that's where your mother and, and brother would, would rest. Yes, and that's where I will. Saving Alligator Light became Larry Hurlth's mission, but it was in the government's hands. And out of frustration, I just thought one day, I'm going to swim to Alligator Lighthouse and see if that can drum up some type of uh, attention. attention. And it which did. It certainly did. Eight miles round trip. The publicity stunt in 2012 made headlines and caught the attention of Rob Dixon, who ran a charity at the local pool. It's Island Rana Statue of Liberty, you know, to put it bluntly. It would be a totally different community if that were not there. The next year, they organized an even bigger swim around the lighthouse, hoping the U.S. government would notice and make some repairs. But still, in 2014, the light went out. Despite their efforts, modern advances in navigation, like GPS, have made the lighthouse obsolete. There would be no repairs. In fact, the Coast Guard determined it no longer needed an active lighthouse there at all. And it was just a sad moment for everyone in town to, you know, everyone said, the light's out, the light's out, because we've seen it all our life. There was one glimmer of hope, a federal law called the National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act. It is strictly for the Coast Guard to dispose of their lights that they no longer have a need for, but they still see is integral to the history of the United States. Ellen Rankin, a historian with the National Park Service, helps manage the program. She explained the government could transfer ownership of the lighthouse, but there's a catch. You're not going to give this away to somebody who's going to put a sports bar in there. Correct. You want this to be someone who's going to take care of it for the greater public good. Correct. That's exactly the purpose of this program. I said maybe we should try to get it. So for months, they worked on their application, making their case to be the new keepers of the lighthouse. There was no guarantee that you were going to get it. No, it, um, and it seemed like a real long shot at the beginning. And as we got closer to submitting this application, it started to seem like a real thing that could happen. So like, well, who's better than us? Nobody. We're the home team. The U.S. government agreed. In December, the deed for Alligator Lighthouse was officially signed over to its new owners. Lighthouse. To me, that is the greatest honor. Yeah. So this is the next chapter in its history. This is it. It will be a monumental task. Stabilizing and restoring it could take years and millions of dollars. I've never done this before, but somebody had to do it. I said, somebody has to take this ball and run with it and get it over the goal line. And with Larry's enthusiasm and, and our community, I know it's going to be amazing. He's got a chance to work on a real live lighthouse. You've gone from the sculptures to the real thing. <laughs> yeah, I think the sculptures are on back burner now. A little easier, the sculptures, than this guy here. Uh, yeah, but absolutely not as satisfying yeah. as this will be. Its lantern may have been extinguished, but Alligator Light's future is looking brighter already. Finally, a nonprofit is on a mission to increase the number of diverse software engineers in the talent pipeline. Carter Evans met with the founder of a startup who's hacking the tech industry's diversity problem. If the tech talent pipeline isn't working, we decided that we were going to rebuild that pipeline. Michael Ellison knows firsthand how difficult it is to break into the tech industry. He grew up with a single mom in rural Maine and was homeless at times. But he excelled at math and was encouraged to study computer science in college. I was sitting in a classroom spending 30 hours to complete an assignment that kids standing next to me were taking, say, two to four hours. I just felt like I wasn't smart enough to major in CS. He dropped out of the program after his freshman year. If you're an underrepresented minority, if you're coming from a low-income background, the system's not designed for you. 
He says one of the main problems is that underrepresented minorities are more likely to attend computer science programs with outdated classes and limited resources. What if you're a computer science student and you're uh, attending a school where your professors can't pass the technical interviews, but you don't have enough people to teach the basic stuff, let alone the cutting edge technologies that the companies want. Ellison eventually got his degree and worked with startups that focused on tech education. One built a training program for companies like Facebook, Google, and Netflix called CodePath, and he realized it could also fill in the gaps in college curricula. Now, students at 60 schools nationwide can take courses on the industry's most in-demand skills like app development and cybersecurity. I wanted to be able to learn mobile development for iOS because I feel like that's a great skill to have. Today is a panel and we have some people in the industry talking to us. We just finished up with lab. Uh, we discussed the assignment for this week. And it looks like we're going to build a clone of Instagram. I think it's looking pretty good. CodePath also helps prepare students for their first tech job interview. More than half of those in the program are minority or first-generation college students, including 20-year-old Fazia Alibiosu, who studies computer science in Maryland. I was hooked. I really was because I learned about Android development, which is something my school doesn't have courses about. And I also got to like talk to people who are already in the industry, like Android engineers. It's been so helpful to know what companies are looking for, especially when you don't know any computer scientists in your life. If we're not being intentional about inclusion, then we're probably unintentionally excluding. Stanford teacher Cynthia Lee created a course called Race and Gender in Silicon Valley. She says programs like CodePath can help address the main factors that have hurt minority job candidates trying to break into the industry. The most important would be um, the hiring um, interview process as well as um, the places where recruiters look. How likely are CodePath graduates to get jobs? If you are, say, a black computer science student at CodePath, 43 times more likely to be able to get a job at one of the most competitive tech companies. And he says landing a job is just the first step. We unapologetically are not just trying to get people in somewhere. We're trying to get them, can you lead a technology company? Can you be someone who's uh, founding tech startups? If you want to talk about racial equity, you have to talk about systemic change. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Michelle Miller. Thank you for watching Eye on America.